Company. Uh, I am a long time uh, Midland person uh, from birth. Uh, for the last 15 years, what I have been doing uh, is specializing as a videographer in climate and energy issues. And during that time, I have uh, interviewed literally thousands by this time of uh, scientists and engineers, including some of the best known and, and uh, most respected on the planet. I have worked and traveled with them now. I've been producing a monthly video for the uh, Yale University School of Environment for the last dozen years. Uh, I have been uh, traveling as part of uh, international science teams to the Arctic now for a decade. And uh, what I'm really most proud of is that uh, the scientists that I have been talking to have been uh, have liked and respected the work that I do enough to just start to drag me along with them on some of the uh, field work that they do in some rather extreme and interesting places. This is uh, exactly a decade ago uh, in the Northern Cascades. Uh, then the year after that, I got a call from uh, a guy in the middle there. Dr. Jason Box, uh, world-renowned glaciologist, asking if I would like to go to Greenland. And I said, yeah. And uh, he crowdfunded that first trip uh, very successfully. And uh, thereafter, we uh, organized something called the Dark Snow Project. And I have been back uh, as part of that. Now, uh, I was in Greenland the seventh time. Uh, this past July, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an update on that. But this has been uh, the learning process for me, is to work alongside science, scientists and uh, question them and challenge them and have them challenge me. And uh, in the course of that, uh, I've picked up a few things. This is our dark snow camp on the ice sheet in 2014. It's a satellite shot from NASA. That was really sort of the experience. Uh, starting a few weeks up there. But um, for tonight, I want to start out with... Uh, All right. So, a, what you don't know that gets you into trouble is what you know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> and uh, the first object lesson from that is that most people think that Mark Twain said it, but actually he did. Um, but whoever said it, uh, it's prob there's probably hardly ever been a maxim that could apply better to the time that we're living in right now. And every week, it seems like I run into somebody else that has done their own research on Facebook and, and <laughs> absolutely has uh, more knowledge than all of the, uh, the scientists with all the degrees and all the societies uh, uh, on the planet. So it's, uh, it's interesting and frustrating. But uh, uh, in July, I was in Greenland. This is a place called Conger Luswak, which is uh, an air hub there. It's an old strategic air command base. Uh, you may wonder why they had an airstrip next to a 500-foot granite wall. Uh, I thought for a while that that was some kind of zoning ordinance in Greenland, but no, <laughs> they just, they've got so many granite walls that there's no place to put airports except right next to one. In this coastal zone, uh, there's no snow in the summertime. So we were going up to one of these glacial fjords um, because the science team that I was with uh, had some uh, sampling they wanted to do. And uh, they, uh, they invited me up there. This is on uh, Western Greenland, a place called Is Isanguata Sermia. Uh, Serbia means glacier in uh, Greenlandic, and Isanguada means the place where all those mountains are. Uh, and more on that later. But uh, this is the, the place where the scientists were taking this in. This is the outlet of the glacier. It's kind of unusual in that uh, the meltwater goes down deep underground under the surface of the glacier develops a big head of pressure and then comes shooting out at what they call an upwelling. 
And this is actually, uh, it's the first time I've ever seen it, and I'm told that this was a very impressive one, but it is not uh, rare uh, in Greenland by any uh, measure. But they wanted this because they wanted to be as close as possible to the source of where the water was coming out because they were measuring uh, uh, methane, which is a greenhouse gas, and they wanted to make sure they got the best possible uh, concentration just as it was coming out. So um, I'll show you a, uh, a uh, drone video here, if I can get it to run. There we go. And this will give you a little bit of a uh, more of a bird's eye view. This is what the, the front of the glacier looks like. And um, this will give you a sense of scale. You can see the people walking down there at the bottom. And you can see the tents there. And uh, the glacier front looks like uh, it's, you know, a construction zone uh, because glaciers are giant bulldozers. And you can see off in the distance there, that is uh, the ice sheet itself, which is three times the size of Texas. On average, it's about a kilometer thick. And uh, at the deepest point, it's a couple miles thick. And it contains enough ice uh, that could possibly, if it were all to melt, and nobody thinks it's going to all melt anytime soon, but it's equivalent to about 22 feet of sea level rise. So, uh, so we, we want to know, because even if 5% of it, or 10% of it melts, that's obviously a big deal. So uh, there's funding for scientists who are going up there. Now, you saw the, the, the setting that we were in here, and so this was sort of the view out of my tent for three days, and um, I, I knew because going in, uh, the scientist that was the leader of the team, Marek Stiebal, he's uh, out of Charles University in Prague, we worked with each other before, and, and you know, he, he likes me, and, and he said, you can come along, uh, we have enough money for a helicopter ride in, but we're going to have to walk out. <laughs> and, um, and and I sort of knew the terrain, and the terrain is, you know, it's like up and down, and it's tundra, and I thought, okay, good. He didn't tell me that we were going to be down in this valley, and that there would be a 1,300-foot vertical uh, to get up with about a 60-degree slope, and that's carrying a 40-pound pack. So I spent several days wondering, am, am I going to die? <laughs> Just for scale, there's a couple of people right there. So uh, finally, you know, the morning came when, when we were packing up, and, and it was beautiful, so that's good. Uh, I thought, well, if I'm going to die, at least, you know, <laughs> look, the pictures will be good. Uh, so um, bottom line is uh, I made it up. Uh, I, was, I, I, was, I held the group up. I was, I was about an hour behind everybody else. But uh, I did make it. And th so that's a pretty good view out onto the ice sheet. So uh, again, three times the size of Texas. And uh, just for scale, um, we, are, we are concerned about Greenland because it's so big. But of course, uh, Antarctica is 10 times as big as Greenland. So there's 200 feet of sea level rise in Antarctica that is now starting to move as well. So Greenland is a good natural laboratory to teach us things about um, how glaciers move and what the physics of ice is. And we know a lot more than we did a few years ago. So we're walking out, and I said, what are those big rocks up there? And they said, those aren't rocks. <laughs> These are musk oxen, and uh, they're actually, they're not oxen, they're more like mountain goats. And they're very curious about us, and they were kind of watching us uh, the whole way out, because after we did the climb, then it was another 14 kilometers uh, after that. And so these guys were kind of lining the hillside, sort of watching us the whole way. They weren't, they weren't aggressive, they were just kind of curious. I understand there's times of the year when you really don't want to approach them. Um, but 
in this case, uh, once they had a good look at us, they kind of just took on. And finally, uh, uh, we did make it. Uh, we hiked the. Uh, we hiked the distance. And just to, just to give you an idea of, of what this looks like, um, tundra is like this really dense vegetation where you're walking and you're going to be sinking in, and, and from time to time you'll sink into mud that will suck your boots right off. And then there's also like rocks hidden in there so that you know they're just big enough you, you can't see them, but they're big enough to break your ankle if you hit them off. So it's, uh, it's not like you can relax uh, uh, while you're uh, out walking on the tundra. And I think I missed a slide here. Let me see. Oh, disappeared. Oh, there it is. OK. Yeah. So we finally did make it. And if you look up here, uh, you'll see just along this ridge, you'll see a road that goes through there. That's what we were aiming for. That is. That is the longest road in Greenland, actually. It's um, only about 25 miles long. But it, it has remained the longest road just because where are you going to go? <laughs> and, uh, uh, if you go up this road about 10 miles, you come to this, which is a, a place where I camped in 2015 on a bluff looking down on this uh, big ice wall. And I wanted to find my way back to it on this trip because I figured there might be some changes uh, that would be interesting to make some like before and after pictures of. And so here's the road. You can see the road here. Down in the lower left of the picture, you see the road. So I was up on a bluff maybe 100 or 200 feet up when I took this picture. The next picture that you're going to see, I actually took down standing on the road. but uh, five, six years later. And so you can see the difference. The, the first time oh, I drove by, I didn't even see it. Uh, I would say, where's the ice wall? And uh, then I realized, oh, well, there it is. And you can see the ice is gone from this rocky slope here, and the whole elevation has come down quite a bit. Now you can see these bluffs uh, back behind here. So, uh, this is the, really the best example that works in a photograph, but everywhere I went, I saw things that I would, uh, I knew where I was, but I, I did not recognize the landmarks that I had been used to seeing. So we're, we're seeing a lot of changes. Um, this is uh, Dr. Box, who I went with on that first trip. He has since become a bit of a media star. He was on this Netflix production with uh, David Attenborough last year, and uh, I'll just uh, let him fill in some, some factoids here for you. So in the current climate, uh, Greenland is already beyond its threshold, uh, where it's now losing 10,000 cubic meters of ice per second. That's the average loss rate. Now, that loss rate will only continue as the climate heats up. So. Uh, Dr. Box had a study that made quite a splash a few months ago that he's been working on for a while. They have some new modeling and uh, looking at how much ice we expect Greenland to lose. And the basic uh, conclusion was that climate change has already set a certain amount of melting in motion that really can't be halted at this point no matter what we do. So we're we're looking at something like a foot of sea level rise that's locked in uh, if, if his study is right. We don't necessarily know the time frame for that. But that's, so that's a foot from Greenland and however much we get from Antarctica, depending on how rapidly we get a handle on this problem. So, okay, hold that thought. And I'm going to skip around a little bit here uh, because the last few weeks have actually been kind of a seminar on the phenomena that uh, meteorologists call weather whiplash, which uh, is exactly like it sounds. Remember 10 days ago when it was record low temperatures across the uh, interior of uh, eastern North America? 
and then suddenly it warmed up. Okay, so what was happening, this is a really nice site from the University of Maine, by the way, not climateanalyzer.org. So what you're looking at here is a map of temperatures. And so the blues are colder than normal, and the reds and the oranges are warmer than normal. And so you see the big blue patch here. Uh, eastern United States is cold. Western United States, and then going way up into Alaska and way up into the Arctic, abnormally warm. And uh, up in Greenland, it's like uh, 15, 20 degrees warmer than normal. And so the reason this is happening, and it's happening more frequently, uh, is uh, a question that I've been following a number of scientists on for uh, 10 years now. And we're finally getting to the point where there's general agreement that something is going on with the jet stream. And you've all heard meteorologists talk about the jet stream. Um, looks like this. Uh, and so this is a high-level flow of air, and this is what guides the weather systems around the planet. And uh, you, so underneath this, you can see North America. You might be able to see Greenland up here at the top. And you can see where in the west, there's this big uh, peak of the jet where southerly warm air is coming up into the west, way up into the Arctic. Uh, over the east, you see that dip where the cold air is coming down from the Arctic into as far down as Florida. And then again, you see another big up, upward pick, a peak, and it's taking air up towards Greenland. So uh, warm here, cold here, warm there. Okay? So I thought to help better understand this, I would uh, rely on some uh, friends that are meteorologists. Jeff Berardelli is a colleague at Yale Climate Connections. Uh, he is also a contributor to that group. And you may have seen him on CBS News. He was a weather specialist on there for a few years. He is now the chief meteorologist at WFLA in Tampa. And so he was observing the exact same thing on October 18th. Because a lot of us are headed into the 40s, daytime highs in the upper 60s, that is more normal for January, not October. Why is this happening? We have a really extreme jet stream heat to the tune of temperatures in the 80s being shunted all the way north into Canada as the jet stream rides to the north, but it does come south in the eastern part of the country. And so we have the polar vortex across the Great Lakes right now. And that's drilling down some chilly air. So it will be pretty chilly around here, believe it or not. Uh, next, this is Chris Galaniger. Uh, Chris uh, actually used to be a uh, uh, weatherman over at WNAM in Saginaw, right here. And he has since moved on and is chief meteorologist at KCCI in Des Moines where he regularly puts uh, his weather stories in a climate context for his viewers and for his troubles gets a steady stream of threats and invective on social media. Uh, but he persists. You might be wondering, why is it so cold here? We only have temperatures into the 30s and 40s. Let's go north. And you can see across parts of Canada, west of Hudson Bay, we have temperatures that are warmer than here into the mid-50s, and then let's go farther north, where on paper this looks cold, but this is way above average for this time of year near the North Pole. So what's happening is, as the North Pole and the polar regions warm in general, there's less of a temperature variation between the polar regions and the mid-latitudes. What that means is the jet stream slows down, becomes wavier, and that wavy pattern takes the coldest air and actually pushes it south down into the mid-latitudes. That is why we're seeing this kind of cold. So, okay, hold that in, in your mind, and I'm going to uh, remind you about a couple of storms you might have heard about briefly in mid-September. The first one is called Verbach. It started in the Pacific as a typhoon. A typhoon is basically just a hurricane that's in the Pacific. And then uh, made its way uh, <laughs> up north, stayed really strong because it was crossing very warm water here, and uh, hit Alaska as a very unusually strong 
September storm. Uh, broke a lot of records and made a little bit of news even down here. Uh, the other one is Fiona, you might have heard of, because it, it did form where we normally expect Atlantic hurricanes to form. It hit Puerto Rico and did some damage. Uh, fortunately, uh, we were all uh, happy it didn't hit the mainland, but it made its way up to Bermuda and then also hit a patch of pretty warm water, strengthened into a Category 4 and stayed strong and hit Nova Scotia as another record-setting storm. And so I want to focus on this one because it teaches us a few things. Um, this is Jennifer Francis, uh, who is uh, one of the world's, uh, well actually she is sort of synonymous with this whole science about jet stream. She's the one that really pushed this idea uh, 10 years ago and uh, she's uh, proven to be mostly right uh, at this point. And so I, I talked to her not long ago uh, as Fiona was making its way up into the Atlantic uh, to give me some insight. One of the interesting stories with Fiona and uh, Murbach as well, which was the big storm that hit uh, western Alaska last week, those both were tropical systems. Fiona still is, but it's transitioning now. Um, both of those storms went over an area of ocean that was much warmer than normal. Even a, You could even call it an ocean heat wave that they both went over. And so... Um, right now, we're seeing Fiona be a Cat 4 hurricane, and it's one of the northernmost Category 4 hurricanes that's ever formed or ever existed in the Atlantic. And this is partly because we've got these blobs of very warm ocean water now sitting in various places, especially in the, in the northern Pacific and northern Atlantic. And so when these storms come along, they've got a lot of energy to tap into. And... Moisture is a big part of that. So those big warm areas of ocean water evaporate a lot of extra water into the atmosphere and the storms just feed on that like, you know, anything feeds on fuel. So um, it's, it's it enabled both of those storms to be extraordinarily potent even after they transition into uh, non-tropical storms. Okay, so... Um this is, uh, I'm going to run this animation uh, several times. You'll get sick of looking at it uh, before I'm done. But what you see there in the circle, that's Fiona. Okay. And you can see the east coast of the United States here. There's Florida, right? And up here you can see Greenland up at the top. And uh, this bright line, that's the jet stream. Okay. So the hurricane likes to kind of ride the jet stream. And what you're going to see is it's heading up, it's spinning counterclockwise, it's riding that jet stream up. And as it spins, and as the jet stream moves up, it's going over that patch of warm water, and so it's picking up warmth and moisture and spinning it, spinning it right up onto the Greenland ice sheet. And just, just watch it a few times and you'll see what I'm talking about. The, the storm is joining with the jet stream, it's combining with the jet stream to create uh, a whole lot of extra momentum for this warm, moist air that is passing and spinning it right up into Greenland and then the storm itself dies somewhere in Baffin Bay there. But, um, let this run a few more times and then it's going to change. But just get that firmly in your mind. You can see where it crosses. It hits Nova Scotia, and then it goes up there. And okay, now we are looking at a heat map. So red is warm and blue is cool. So now you see that big blob of warm air getting picked up and mobilized and streamed on up towards Greenland. This is something that meteorologists call an atmospheric river. And when uh, California has those tremendous rainstorms and floods, they get that atmospheric river off of the Pacific Ocean. This is an atmospheric river in a place where they don't see a lot of atmospheric rivers in September and Greenland ice sheet. So uh, this is a time of year when Greenland should be 
completely cold, and if there's any precipitation, it should be rain or, or snow, but it's going to get a big blast of warm moisture and rain going deep into the ice sheet. And indeed, we had uh, a very unusual late September strong melting event uh, due to that uh, phenomenon. And so the, the lesson that I'm drawing from this, and it was really uh, Dr. Box that put me onto this when uh, we had a conversation about the time that this was happening. And uh, so you've got wonky jet stream, which is related to climate change, and you've got blobs of heated, warm ocean, which is related to climate change, and then you get a storm that comes in, and suddenly those seemingly unrelated things become related because the storm is the X factor that sort of makes that synergizes them and makes them behave in a way that would have been very, very, very unusual in the past. And as a result, we get a, a strong late season melt on Greenland. And so the lesson is that uh, the models that we're using to try to figure out how fast Greenland is going to melt probably don't reflect this because this is an emergent behavior of the atmosphere that it just is so random and is so hard to even think about that people just haven't built this in to their models yet. And we don't know how frequently this is going to happen, but it seems reasonable to presume that it may happen more often and later and later in, in the year. So we may get these strong melting events uh, in the shoulder seasons where we, we typically haven't had them uh, in the past. So, uh, okay, switching gears a little bit. This is a quiz. Uh, anybody want to guess where this picture was taken? Just raise your hand, it's okay. I'm not a nun. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I wouldn't make any nun jokes. That's the only one. Okay, this is the Mississippi River. Uh, this is like three days ago. Okay. Uh, this is uh, just a little bit south of Memphis. And so, uh, my understanding is that north of Baton Rouge, uh, up as far as Memphis and probably a little bit further, they're seeing the, uh, the record low uh, that they have seen, that is, has been recorded on the on Mississippi. Um, and so there's lots of scenes uh, like this, uh, but it's not that unusual this year because you've been paying attention to what's going on in uh, Europe. Uh, all over Europe, the Rhine, the Rhone, the Danube, the Seine, the Po, all look like this this past summer. And uh, over in China, uh, the Yangtze looked like this. And in fact, this event was very poorly reported in the United States. The, the heat wave that is still going on in China was completely off the charts, completely ahistorical, and uh, really interesting um, uh, knock-on effects on the economy. Uh, I just threw in another uh, drone shot of this city just because I thought it was kind of stunning. It's a place called Tiptonville, Tennessee. So there's whole uh, tourist attractions happening now, and, and they've uh, they found some Civil War boats that have emerged from muck and, and uh, a few bodies. You know. So anyway, uh, the reason that's happening, and this is the, the new uh, drought monitor map from NOAA, just released today. Uh, Chris Gleininger tweeted this out and, said, and pointed out that 84% of the country is at least abnormally dry right now. That's the lowest uh, rating is abnormally dry and it goes up to exceptional drought and you can see right in the center of the country very 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 dry i was in missouri uh, about three weeks ago and i uh, took a little drive and uh, every riverbed that i passed was looked like a sandbar and it was really really remarkable 
And uh, so you can see the Mississippi watershed on this map. And these browns obviously indicate dryness. So you can see this critical part of the country is very, very dry now. And the prospect for uh, precipitation, although they had a little rain the other day, uh, not nearly enough to, to really break the drought. And the prospect for the next three months, which is what this map shows, is that brown is exactly what you think it is. It's going to be pretty dry. So this is an evolving uh, event. It's already a $9 billion catastrophe. And uh, because it's slowing down barge traffic on the um, Mississippi, where 92% of our agricultural exports go down the Mississippi. So uh, the farmers who are already dealing with the drought, now they can't get their products out to market. So either the products will just rot or, or maybe they'll have to sell them for a cut rate, but the farmers are going to get hammered here. So uh, watch that space. And we could, of course, we could go on and on and on about impacts. There's lots of things to talk about there, but uh, I like to talk about uh, what we're doing about this. Uh, First answer is not enough, but not because we don't have the means to do something about it. We have the technology that we need. What we have lacked uh, is the political will. So um, just to put a little local spin on this, um, this is an article that was in the Wall Street Journal on May 27th, uh, written by a local, local boy. Uh, Jason Hayes, who is the environmental uh, poobah or something at the Mackinac Center, and um, wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal saying, electrical blackouts are coming to Michigan. So I thought, you know, it might be, it's been several months now that we can look back at this and see how did he do for his prediction. Um, remembering our maxim, uh, it's what you know for sure that ain't so that gets you in trouble. Um, he writes, wind and solar are wholly dependent on the weather. They must have ample backup from nuclear, coal, and gas-fired plants. Okay. Uh, and he also says, Michigan consumers and businesses will deal with uh, in the form of higher rates. They have higher rates because of solar and wind. Okay, so what happened over the summer? Well, first of all, we didn't have a blackout. And the power plant that failed was not wind or solar, it was actually the Down Sea Cook nuclear plant, which on August 29th, right, sort of in the middle of the, or tail end of the air conditioning and heating season, uh, I think the technical term is it cracked out. Um, uh, automatically shut down due to a failure of a coolant pump, which nuclear plants are prone to do. And to be fair, this, this nuclear plant has a pretty good record. Uh, it's generally reliable, except when it's not. And so the point that I'm making here is that I'm not beating up on Donald Secret nuclear plant, because generally it's reliable and it's producing uh, carbon-free power, and we like that. Uh, but anyone that tells you that solar and wind and clean energy are somehow unique in that they have to be backed up by some other form of energy, that person, first of all, does not know what they're talking about. Or, if they do know what they're talking about, then they are deliberately misleading you. Because these are not, these are not true statements. Because as you can see from this, do you all remember the... the giant blackout we had in September? Anybody? I don't. Because <laughs> it didn't happen, of course. And the reason is because anybody that builds a nuclear plant knows darn well <laughs> that you got to have that nuclear plant backed up, which we do, by, you know, whatever the mix of, of uh, our system is. It'll be coal and gas, and yes, solar and wind, and also energy storage, and increasingly something called virtual power plants, which is a thing. And so uh, the world-class, highly professional operators on our grid 
weather this storm. Totally unexpected loss of a thousand megawatts of power, and they did it just fine. And if you compare that, say, to solar, uh, instead of like an unexpected loss of instantaneous power with solar, what you got is you check your iPhone, you say, hey, hey guys, the sun goes down at 7.15 tonight, plan accordingly. And so as a result, grids that have a huge penetration of wind and solar, like for instance Germany, with almost 50%, Germany's grid is five times as reliable as the United States grid. Because that's the way they build it. And they have good engineers, but so do we. So uh, the article also said that we would see Bill Soar. Now he was right. He was right about that, according to the Wall Street Journal. But why? Utility customers, faced with some of the largest bills in years, set to pay even more as natural gas prices continue to climb. Why are natural gas prices climbing? They have more than doubled this year in the United States because of a global supply shortage made worse by the war in Ukraine. Because even though the United States is the world's largest producer of gas, not even close, we are the world's largest producer of oil, it's not even close, we are still subject to uh, global shortages from uh, force majeure events like wars and also just plain blackmail by the autocrats and oligarchs like, for instance, Vladimir Putin, who is using natural gas as a weapon against democracy globally. He hopes to destabilize the democratic world through uh, energy warfare. That's what's going on. And so the price of gas in Europe has skyrocketed. It's actually, it's bouncing all over. I think they had negative prices the other day. And then, and then it was three weeks ago, it was 10 times a, a normal price. Um, you probably saw this picture. Of the, the Russians blew up one of the critical pipelines underneath the North Sea, the North Stream 2. And uh, that was obviously a message that, you know, we're not kidding around. We're really not going to be sending you any gas uh, anytime soon. Uh, so far, it looks like Europe is going to weather the storm uh, this winter, but uh, they're counting on, uh, on warm weather. And this is the price of gas in the United States over the last year. And uh, you see these big humps on the left-hand side. And here's the date where the Ukraine invasion starts, and you kind of get an idea of what the, the dynamic is here. Seven years ago, eight years ago, by law, the United States was not exporting gas. Um, we had a few pipelines going into Mexico, maybe, maybe Canada, but essentially not exporting gas. That law was changed, and then we started building these big uh, liquefied natural gas tankers, you may have seen pictures of, and they cool the gas down to minus 160 centigrade and it shrinks by a factor of 600 so they can pack huge volumes of, of it onto tankers. And those, those go out to the world. So now, U.S. consumers, gas consumers, who were not exposed to the global market 10 years ago, are now competing with Europe and Asia and places where they are willing to pay five or even ten times more for that gas. And so when you get a war going on, and maybe, I don't know, a global pandemic, something like that, then your price is going to go crazy. It's going to be unpredictable. And so, uh, just for comparison, last time I checked, the price of wind had not changed, the price of sun had not changed. <laughs> Uh, with the price of gas, is anybody guess? And just for example, uh, you might have seen that uh, uh, 60 Minutes had a piece on uh, wind power a couple weeks ago up in the North Sea. And the price of uh, that wind is actually um, nine times cheaper than the, uh, the price of natural gas as it was at least in the last month or two. 
it keeps changing. But uh, 60 Minutes, I thought, did kind of a lousy job because they, they asked a couple of crab fishermen, well, what, what do you think of pricing? <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, so, well, I don't like paying for this, you know. And, I mean, <laughs> it was oversimplified, uh, to, to say the least. But the point is, uh, that offshore wind, which used to be a relatively expensive source of power, is now quite a bit more competitive and looking especially good in uh, terms of the national security situation. Now, uh, we talked about the rivers. And this is another, uh, this is another um, hurdle for traditional power plants. So when the water level, well level is low at these major rivers, this is, this is a super highway that they ship things like coal. So coal plants were running into trouble because the water was so low, either the barges couldn't go at all or they had to be like uh, only half loaded because they otherwise couldn't pass. So this was hitting output at coal plants. And... Uh, it also hits nuclear plants because when the water level is low, a lot of people don't realize this, but 40%, and I'm sure this is true in Europe as it is in the United States, 40% of all the surface water withdrawals in the United States go to cooling uh, thermal power plants, coal, gas, and nuclear, 40%. So when the water levels in the river are low like this, you either have to shut, well, you have to shut down or derate your power plant because either you have no water or the water you have is at such a low level that if you, if you use that much of it for cooling, you're going to have, you're going to basically heat up the river so much that you'll drive out all the oxygen and kill everything in the river. So, uh, so at a certain point, um, France, which is famously has a very advanced nuclear uh, capacity, uh, they were having to shut down a lot of their plants, and not only because of uh, the water situation, but because uh, they're running into a lot of problems with repair and uh, malfunctions due to corrosion, which is uh, very serious because you don't want your cooling pipes corroding on your nuclear plant. And so as of August 29th, 57% uh, of the nuclear generation capacity of France was shut down. And so this is, you know, in the midst of a war, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a, uh, a gas shut off by the major European supplier, uh, the nuclear plants uh, were not able to meet the challenge. Uh, Wall Street Journal published on this just three days ago. France's nuclear reactors malfunction, energy, energy crisis bites, France swung from being the largest exporter of electricity to a net importer because of outages at their nuclear plants. And where were they importing electricity from? Well, German wind turbines and, and solar farms and, and, and uh, UK solar farms and also gas and, and everything else. But the point is, uh, they kept the lights on because there was enough transmission capacity to move, that, move some power around and, uh, and keep them going. So, meanwhile, on this side of the pond, uh, Texas, which is, uh, uh, of course, huge in all things energy, um, Texas is a place that uh, has extremes uh, of temperature in, in both summer and winter, but in the springtime, they usually expect that it will be mild and moderate weather, and so that is the time when they usually like to do maintenance on their power plants because there's not too much demand for air conditioning, so they can shut the power plants down, get the maintenance done, and then they're ready for the summer peak during hot weather. Well, the hot weather came in April, and it stayed right on into the summer and set records uh, through May. And so it was so hot that they were unable to do their uh, maintenance. So as a result, power plants started falling offline. And in one, one day, they had six gas-fired power plants go offline. And they had to uh, uh, ask, ask people to uh, limit their use of electricity. 
And this kind of continued through the summer, and the headline out of Texas was that what was bailing them out was the solar and the wind. Because the solar and the wind stayed steady, uh, especially the solar, which has been uh, rapidly expanding in Texas, and it was obviously a pretty good choice during the, the hot uh, heat wave that they had in the spring. So uh, I guess what I'm saying here is like, uh, the uh, the original article in the Wall Street Journal was you know not just wrong from the Mackinac Center. It was like 180 degrees backwards in terms of what we're actually seeing develop on the ground here. Uh, this study uh, came out just last week from uh, scientists at the University of Texas, some of whom uh, I know. Uh, and it pointed out that solar and wind has saved Texas customers more than $7 billion just in 2022 up till August. Uh, prior to that, solar and wind since 2010 have saved them almost $28 billion. And then uh, 2022 so far, $7 billion. And that's, of course, because the price of gas has shot up so high. So uh, that's going to continue. And uh, by the way, uh, we were talking about water. Uh, the clean energy has also saved them uh, a ton of water. In fact, several tons. Um, had there not been any renewables on the ERCOT grid, power plants would have withdrawn between 272 billion and 1300 billion more gallons of water per year. Uh, for reference, 1300 billion gallons is the annual use of about 14 million Texans. So water, we've been talking about, obviously is going to be a constraint going forward, and it's certainly a constraint in a place like Texas. Wind and solar use essentially no, little or no water. So this is a, this is a consideration. And some of, you, some of you may say, but Pete, I heard about that time that Texas had a winter cold snap back in February of 2021. And I heard that all the wind turbines froze, and so the grid shut down and a lot of people died. Anybody hear that story? Yeah. Okay. So my wife will tell you that I spend way too much time online. Uh, but the result of my wasted life is that I know a lot of people uh, who are very smart, and I follow them. And in the days leading up to Valentine's Day in February 2021, there was a lot of chatter uh, coming out of Texas and people that were knowledgeable about Texas because they were watching this giant uh, cold wave coming down from the Arctic, the jet stream, right? wonky jet stream, bringing this wave down, and people said, this is going to be historic cold. And Texas grid might not be ready for this because they've had problems in the past. And it was sounding really concerning. So I called up my friend, Michael Osborne. Michael Osborne is in Austin. He is the former CEO of Austin Energy, which is one of the largest utilities in Texas. <laughs> They have coal, gas, nuclear, solar, wind, uh, and he knows it all. So I said, Michael, what's going on? And he was watching in real time. He could watch the grid. Uh, and he said, I, he said, I see things going down just right in front of me. I, I think we could lose the whole grid. And if, if you have a, 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 like a blackout over your whole grid, what can happen is uh, the... the uh, the coal plants, the nuclear plants, the gas plants, they've got these turbines that are spinning at fantastic rates of speed. They've got all kinds of uh, gear that's under tremendous heat and pressure. You can break these things. And if you break them, then you can't get your grid started back up, maybe for weeks, maybe for months. So they were looking at a possibility of, in the depths of winter, having their grid go down completely. And it's really a testimony to the good work of the people at ERCOT, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, that they were able to avert that 
they said that they came within four minutes of having the entire grid just crash around them. So I uh, was following that <coughs> whole event, uh, not just with the smart people that I knew, but also with Texas media. So TV stations like WFAA in Dallas, KHOU in Houston, KVUE in Austin, and also the Dallas Morning News, the Houston Chronicle, Austin American Statesman, fantastic journalism. They, were, they recognized the importance of this event and they were on it right from the beginning in depth. And I put together a, a, a video piece because this question has come up so often and has been uh, so sorely distorted and misused that I think uh, a, a fact check was uh, in order. So that's what we're going to see here. Four minutes and 37 seconds, ERCOT revealing tonight, that's how close Texas was from a total collapse of its power grid. What we saw in Texas, um, you know, was a, a colder, deeper, wider amount of weather that we've really, you know, we've had events that have led to, to failures before. We had really bad deep freezes in Texas in 1983, 1989, 2011, and 2021. And each one strained the grid and led to a blackout of one sort or another. But it feels like a replay of 2011 in terms of power plants tripping offline, the natural gas is freezing up, the gas freeze off, causing more power plants to go offline, and then you have like a water crisis and this kind of thing. As several power plants around the state failed, Central Texans faced ongoing electric blackouts as ERCOT cut off power across the region, neighborhood by neighborhood. The feds had warned Texas of poor winterizing plans a decade ago after another big freeze crippled the state. But recommendations in this report, FERC's new chairman says, were largely ignored. But this one was uh, was just colder and wider and longer, lasted longer than, um, than, than, than previous events. All 254 Texan counties have imposed a winter storm warning. That's never happened before. As the cold Arctic mass um, came in, as we saw an extreme increase in the demand for heating in Texas as you know, everyone was wanting to stay warm. About 60% of homes in Texas use electricity, 40% use for natural gas, and we just saw like a, an extremely high amount of heating. Now, we meet, some, we meet peak demands like this in the summer all the time. The difference between this, this, uh, this event and that event is there was competition in the natural gas system. So while you know, power plants were wanting to consume natural gas to make that electricity, homes were also wanting to consume natural gas for heating. And at the same time, our supply out of West Texas, we had some wells freeze off, some, some gathering lines freeze, and we weren't able to put more gas into the system, and we ended up short on the natural gas system. So some power plants couldn't get gas. Um, some other power plants also had freezing issues with cooling water or sensors or all kinds of things. When it all came down to it, you know, we lost about 40% of our thermal fleet during the time when you know, we were uh, you know, demanding the most amount um, from both of these systems. Transmission connections between Texas and the rest of the United States are really pretty limited. So it's difficult for other places in the United States to come to their aid by shipping power. Every source of power that the state of Texas has has been compromised. The entire natural gas system from the wellhead to the power plant really just broke down. Uh, access to coal uh, generated power, access to gas generated power also have been compromised, uh, whether it be with regard to systems freezing up or equipment failures. It's just frozen right now. It's frozen in the pipeline. It's, it's frozen at the rig. Uh, it's frozen in the transmission line. So, and so they are incapable, that they, the, the natural gas providers, are incapable of being able to come up with the gas that feeds into the generators that generate the power uh, to, that will send power to people's residences there in the Dallas area, uh, as well as uh, our nuclear power facility. One of the lead reasons in the Houston area in particular uh, that caused uh, power outages is the South Texas nuclear project uh, was shut down uh, because uh, of an operational difficulty. Comanche Peak, which is a, a nuclear reactor, was within just minutes of going offline. And if that had happened, we really could have had a blackout. By far the biggest piece that he's the 
that overwhelmed every other piece of the story is, is the way that the gas systems and the gas electricity wasn't there when we needed it. Actually, it's more their natural gas plants that have been affected by the cold weather than it is their wind. And wind turbines had their trouble with ice on blades, but wind wasn't the biggest problem for the grid. The biggest problem for the grid was the frozen thermal plants, the plants that use coal or natural gas or nuclear that really didn't show up to perform. You're here the people who talked about the freezing of the wind turbines. It was a very small percentage of uh, the power generation that was lost in Texas from renewables. The vast majority was from uh, base load generation. During the daytime, solar was the one thing that fire performed and, and gave us way more power than we expected. It's a, it's a complex set of factors, but what we know right now is that uh, the wind power plants are mostly meeting their expected performance levels. But what is not happening in Texas is that many of the thermal power plants, the plants that boil water to make electricity, like natural gas-fired power plants, coal-fired power plants, and at least one nuclear unit, are not um, producing energy. They're, they're, they're suffering outages, and that dwarfs the amount of wind resource that's not performing right now. So it really is a, a traditional power plant problem, not a clean energy problem. I and many others have been telling them for years, you should be starting to think about extreme weather events that we know are getting worse. Demonstrably, regardless of your viewpoint on climate change and cause, Texas is, is in the gun sites for an awful lot of extreme weather and extreme weather is getting worse and worse. We designed this entire grid for Ozzy and Harriet weather. We are already facing that max, and it's getting worse. So, um, that's the story as it was on the ground in Texas. And you saw Governor Greg Abbott there saying, we, we were missing coal, we were missing gas, it was frozen at the ribs, it's frozen, it's frozen at the pipeline, it's frozen at the plant, nuclear plants down. Because he was facing a, a group of hard-nosed Texas journalists who were following the event and knew the score. So he, he knew that he, he would have to be up front with them because they, they weren't going to be fooled. Uh, but that same night, he went on Fox News of course. and said the following, and I won't even tell you what to think. I will just say compare and contrast. So this shows how the Green New Deal would be a deadly deal for the United States of America. Texas is blessed with multiple sources of energy, such as uh, natural gas and oil uh, and nuke. Uh, but you saw from what Trace said, uh, and that is our wind and our solar got shut down, and, and they were uh, collectively more than 10% of our power grid. Uh, it just shows uh, that fossil fuel is necessary uh, for the state of Texas as well as other states to make sure that we were, uh, will be able to heat our homes in the wintertime and cool our homes in the summertime. Okay, so I have a, I have a I'm just about to go to Q&A. Can you remember it? Sure. Okay, just hold that thought and we'll, we'll start right out with you. Um, so yeah, it's not what you know, it, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so that gets you. And uh, I'm just going to finish off with, uh, this was in the New York Times this morning, the uh, uh, International Energy Agency came out with their latest uh, assessment of, of where we are. And in their assessment, they say the war in Ukraine is likely to speed up this transition because many of these new clean energy targets are not being put in place solely for climate change reasons. Uh, they are being put in place, uh, the biggest drivers are energy security as well as industrial policy. A lot of countries want to be at the leading edge of the energy industries of the future. And it should be apparent by now, I don't know how many times during my lifetime we've had the opportunity to learn this and we have not. Maybe we're learning it now. But as long as we remain uh, uh, beholden and dependent on fossil fuels, we are going to be vulnerable to be uh, to this kind of blackmail by some of the very worst people in the world. And it doesn't matter how much we drill or blast or strip or mine, because as long as it's priced on a global market and somebody can uh, manipulate that global market, 
well, we're going to be open for blackmail. So it continues, we continue this dependence on fossil fuels at great risk to our sovereignty, to our economy, uh, yes, to the living system of the planet, but also to the democracy that we take for granted. Uh, that's where we are. And uh, I will finish with this. Uh, I was at a uh, fortunate to be at a hearing for a wind farm permit in Isabella County at the Isabella County Planning Commission. This was uh, 2019. Before COVID, do you remember? Uh, yeah, and uh, and so a lot of people stood up uh, to say, a few people stood up to uh, raise objections to the wind power. Um, uh, by far, the most people stood up in support. And the one that made the biggest impression, that really got the biggest uh, uh, applause, <coughs> from the audience was not uh, a professor at the university or an engineer or a politician. It was a simple farmer named John Fabian who uh, lives up in uh, Rosebush, Michigan. And when you hear what he has to say, I think you'll understand why. Well, my name is John Fabian. This is I-31 East Vernon Road, Rosebush. And my family is in support of this. And probably for a different reason than anybody in this room. See, in 2004, our son Eric Fabian, as an 18 year old United States Marine, was sent to the country of Iraq, combat duty in the region called the Triangle of Death. And after seven months of combat, he returned. He still has physical and emotional scars from that duty. And the reason we all know these men were sent there was for energy in the form of crude oil. And 15 years later, we still send our young people to the Middle East for crude oil. And projects like this that create the energy right here that's going to be used here, not put in a tanker and sent around the world. These are the projects we need. And so Apex is willing to partner with our family and put a windmill or a wind turbine on our property. We're willing to do that, so maybe it will keep some other family from seeing their son or daughter sent to these foreign lands for energy when we can produce it right here. Okay, so that's the formal part of the presentation. Uh, I hope that there are some questions and perhaps I'll have some answers. Uh, if you want to follow the work that I do, I have uh, two very important websites. One is wind101.info, uh, the other is sun101.org, uh, where I have a whole lot of uh, uh, pushback information for social media because these discussions are being held on social media. And uh, uh, I'd like to make these resources available, uh, some of the same kinds of things that you've seen here tonight. Um, and uh, so by all means, check those out. Uh, my own blog is climatecrocs.com, uh, also called Climate Denial Croc of the Week. Uh, sort of a little tongue-in-cheek, where I try to shoot down misinformation on a regular basis. I'm very proud that I, I have a following of some pretty high-powered people at various universities and NASA and all on elsewhere, and they appreciate what I'm doing there. You can also follow me uh, at Peterson, Peter W. Sinclair on Twitter, if you don't mind my occasional intemperate rants, uh, but, uh, and you can contact me through there as well. But uh, hopefully there will be some questions. You had one. Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, you had any insight. I thought I was under the impression that Texas had a lot of problems because they hadn't done any maintenance. Well, uh, they what they had not done is weatherized their their whole power system. So, uh, in other words, 
Uh, that's why the freezing. Yeah, that, that's why the gas lines and everything freezes. Uh, uh, Texas is really interesting in that they have their own grid down there. You know, the rest of the country is one thing, and Texas is a whole other thing. And they are very, very free market driven. Okay which is one reason why they're building a tremendous amount of solar and wind, because it makes sense. But unfortunately, just like their, their gas plants, they don't weatherize their wind turbines either. So the, uh, uh, Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, Kansas, Oklahoma, all have a lot of wind power, uh, were under the same weather system and didn't have a problem at all, because they're all weatherized, as they are here in Michigan. So uh, Texas had a problem across the board because uh, they don't believe in all that regulatory stuff, you know. <laughs> and every every once in a while they pay the price. You know, the the ironic thing is that while 700 people were dying in that cold wave, uh, the the guys the price of gas shot up. Uh, I don't know to some ridiculous. Price and so the, 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 the gas barons made out like absolute uh, 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 kings, well pirates, you know, uh, yeah, just just uh, uh, unheard of amounts of money that they made in just those three or four days, and at the same time, uh, because of the way the system is set up, ordinary people, single moms and students and stuff, were ending up with like thousands of dollars in gas bills because they that's what they do there. They just allow the price to just sort of float and they say, well, don't worry about the free market. If the price is high, the free market will come in and solve the problem. Well, so as a result, every decade or two, when they have a situation like this, uh, it kind of goes to hell on them. So uh, yeah, so you're right. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Well, you just raised the effect of the year of the increase in you know, electric vehicles we go forward over the next few decades on the, the whole electrical grid. Well, we're going to have to generate more electricity, you know, because we're not just going to go to electric vehicles. We want to go to electric heating, you know, uh, and both of those have the advantage of being a lot more efficient. So in terms of like total energy, however you want to measure that, uh, uh, we can actually, you know, decrease the total demand for energy while increasing the absolute numbers or amount of electricity that we're generating. So for instance, if we, uh, uh, if we go to uh, electric cars, uh, you know, the combustion engine cars are about, I don't know, 20 or 30 percent efficient at best. And electric car is more like 80 or 90 percent efficient. So you, we're going to get a whole lot more out of that energy. And the same thing with uh, heat pumps and, and other, uh, you know, induction stoves and, and things like that as well. The, uh, the problem is going to come when... Uh, uh, if you have a whole lot of people getting plugging their cars in all at the same time, and particularly if uh, if that's like peak time, say between three o'clock in the afternoon and you know sundown, uh, that's going to be a, a big drain on the system. Now, you can handle that with pricing because you simply uh, uh, make a price incentive so that you you have the highest price during the the big demand part of the day and then you have a low price at night and so you encourage people to just you know plug that car in at night and uh, then we'll disperse that load around 24 hours and that will take up a lot of the slack uh, uh, initially. Uh, what we're going to have to do is build a whole lot more solar and a whole lot more wind and as we move over time to having a greater and greater percentage of the grid that is operating on fuel that is free, uh, then that will give us an economic advantage. And we hope that uh, 
over that time we will we will gradually rely less and less on natural gas as a fuel natural gas is about half of our electricity i think right now or more uh we will we will still keep some of those gas plants around but we will try to use them more as a as a backstop rather than as like frontline uh, generation and so uh, the people that I've talked to who have modeled, you know, into the future, say 2035, 2040, they can easily uh, do the math that gets us to, say, 80% or so uh, clean energy on the grid. And then uh, after that is when uh, the arguments start about, you know, how do you get that last 20%. A lot of people say it's fine, just build a lot more solar and wind. Some other people say no, we're going to need some kind of advanced nuclear or maybe some kind of dark horse technology like uh, geothermal, which is a real prospect and I think one of the uh, ones that people should, should know more about. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be a challenge. You know, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be uh, up to the engineers to come up with uh, innovative ways to to meet all that demand. But it's technically you can you can uh, you, you can you kind of squint at it. You can see the outlines of how we can solve that problem. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Are you able to address some of the topics of the issues concerning um, what I've heard the the effort to eliminate gas? stove cooking huh. and go to electric or whatever? Well, I mean, the, the, the issue is that, you know, I mean, uh, uh, gas is, is explosive and toxic, you know, and we're bringing it into our house and burning it. And uh, there's the more that we look at that, the more we realize, yeah, it's really probably not, you know, the best thing, but it's become a big controversy because now there are some cities and municipalities that are starting to make rules that you can't run gas lines into new uh, new housing built or, or new builds of any kind. And this has become uh, a big deal that the, uh, uh, the fossil fuel industry is uh, kind of getting ready to really go to, go to that on. And it's uh, it's an issue in, in this election because uh, if uh, if the fossil fuel industry gains more influence uh, in this election, then it's going to be harder to make that transition away from natural gas. And so um, it's uh, it's something we should be thinking about. But but you know, as far as the actual engineering aspects of it. Uh, does that help? Yeah, you can. <laughs> but, but what? But what? Well, I mean, it seems to me what we all would need to know, and there hopefully would be some some documents or evidence <clears throat> that could sway people to understand why they're really saying not to use gas. And I had heard, you know, about some toxins and and gases that are unhealthy for people, you know, those kinds of things would make a lot of sense to know, just like smoking at sure. one time we thought smoking sure. was fine, but yeah. now we know how bad it is. Right, right. And, and I, I'm seeing more and more uh, research come out about that. Uh, I think more and more people are, are taking it up as a, as a subject. And, and so there's, if you do a little searching, you will find uh, a fair amount of material on that, and then, and then, of course, just uh, every once in a while, you'll have somebody's house blow up, you know, uh, or even like several houses blow up. That's happened in Boston a few weeks ago, and uh, an occasional pipeline uh, uh, explosion and things like that. So there, you know, there's a number of things about gas that are problematic above and beyond the the climate. Uh, potential that it has, which is massive, and uh, maybe a lot worse than, than what we think. So, yeah. Yeah, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, 
you know, industrial scale energy storage, electrical energy storage, or what yep. the present or the future that might look like? Yeah, we can talk about that. <coughs> um, so, uh, some of you may be aware that uh, we have, uh, here we go. Some of you may be aware that we have uh, some really good options for energy storage right here in Michigan. In fact, we uh, potentially uh, can really step out in front of leadership, certainly in the Midwest, because of the en energy storage potential that we already have in place uh, up in, in Ludington, uh, the Ludington pump storage power plant. And uh, I asked uh, a few people about that. Uh, Wolfgang Bauer at Michigan State He's a nuclear engineer, but he actually runs their solar uh, array that they have down there. Talk to him. And also, I think you'll see Patty Poppy here, who up until a year ago was the CEO of, of Consumers Energy. Let's see if I'm right. The remaining question is, of course, uh, what do you do about energy storage? And what do you mission this We have the largest battery that I know of, at least in North America, here in Michigan, it's called the Ludington Pump Hydro Storage Plant. Ludington Pump Storage is the great engineering marvel, great engineering marvels of the world. It is the fourth largest battery in the world. It has six units. I, I don't know how familiar you are, or if you've ever visited, but you should, because it's gorgeous. It's the most gorgeous power plant in the world. <laughs> On the banks of Lake Michigan, pumps water up into a 27 billion gallon reservoir, and we have the six largest motors in the world. Each unit has a 500,000 horsepower motor. And those six largest motors in the world pump the water up. They, were, they power the pumps to take the wa water up into the reservoir. And then when we need the power, those motors rotating in reverse generate electricity. 2,200 megawatts of carbon-free, emission-free, clean, pure Michigan power. Today, we fill the reservoir once a day. But when we have fully deployed those five and then 6,000 megawatts of solar, we'll have excess power in the day. California is dealing with this, and they're concerned about what do you do with extra power in the daytime. In Arizona these days, between the hours of 11 a.m. and 2 p.m., we get uh, negatively priced electricity from California. There's so much solar being produced in California, they can't use it all. They push it to, to Arizona during those hours and pay our utilities to take it off the grid. And guess what we're going to do with it? We're going to pump and fill the reservoir at Ludington. And then we're going to use that reservoir to serve the peak load, and then at night, our wind farms generating extra electricity will also then refill the pond and we're going to get to refill that pond twice a day because of the upgrade we've done on those motors that is exciting that's it that doubles the capacity of that battery for the service of people of michigan and the inclusion then in our clean energy plan so uh, so we have this big uh, what's called pump storage power plant, you saw how it works there basically. This is 100 year old technology, it's very well understood, it's very efficient, it's like 80% efficient. And uh, it's, it's low cost compared to other uh, means of storage. And it is uh, uh, quite adaptable uh, in that we're, we're not gonna see any other plants like that on the shores of the Great Lakes just because it, who can, who can afford it. Uh, but I was in Indiana not long ago and I talked to Dr. Peter Schubert at the University of Indiana and they are looking at old coal, abandoned coal mines, underground coal mines, which are just uh, kind of sitting there. They're filling with water uh, as it is and they're a little bit of a pollution problem. Uh, but uh, if, if you... Uh, use a little bit of imagination, you can uh, imagine uh, retrofitting that so that you can bring water up into the upper chambers during the times when you have a lot of energy and not much demand. And then when you need, uh, you have a lot of demand, you open up the 
valve and the water flows down to the lower chambers and you use that to generate power. There are literally thousands of sites like this around the country. Uh, there are, of course, throughout Appalachia, but in northern Michigan, there are scientists at Michigan Tech University who are looking at this for some of the abandoned uh, iron and copper mines, underground mines, uh, across Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Uh, vast, vast potential, thousands of, of potential of uh, mines. Uh, and of course the West, uh, lots and lots of mines, opportunities over there. That's just one technology. There are dozens of technologies that are jostling uh, right now and starting to uh, uh, get some traction. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a company called, I think it's called High Power, and uh, they have kind of a brilliant uh, plan because they basically just they use electricity to liquefy and compress air and then at the times of demand where they need to release that energy it just they just allow it to expand and it creates enough force to spin a turbine and they can generate power and the beauty of it is that uh, industrially we make the equipment for other purposes of big pressurized tanks so they don't have to create any kind of original supply chain or anything like that. They can buy stuff off the shelf, as it were, repurpose it for their storage device, and just scale it to whatever, you know, however many tanks they need. And they're building some pretty good sized facilities, I think, uh, out in California right now. There is uh, another company, uh, the name of which will come to me any second, that is building a, a battery based on iron and it's uh, oxidation and reduction. And I'll be darned if I can remember which one is which, but uh, apparently you store the energy by letting the iron essentially turn to rust and then you release the energy when it, you turn it back into iron. And these are batteries that will last uh, for a week. You can store energy and keep it and release it over a week. So they're building a pilot project, I think, in Minnesota right now. There are, of course, the lithium-ion batteries that we're familiar with, but there are uh, uh, just, just dozens and dozens of other technologies for energy storage, and they're following the same price curve that we have seen with technology generally over the last 25 years, you know, with, with computer chips, with computer memory, with solar panels, with, with wind turbines, we have seen the price come down. Uh, there is something called Wright's Law that just says, whatever you're building, whatever widget you are building, if you double the number of widgets, then the price is going to come down uh, by something between 15 and 30 percent. And we have seen that uh, play out with uh, across technology. It's just a general rule. So the more that we can scale this up, and the faster we scale it up, the greater the velocity of that price drop is going to be going forward, no matter which technology we choose. And we see this, uh, and that's why um, we're in such an interesting moment right now because a lot of the technologies that we're relying on uh, follow something they call the S-curve. And the S-curve basically sort of looks like an S, it's like this. And it means that you start out at a really, really low level and you can be toddling along with the technology that might be growing at 40% a year, like solar was for 30 years but it was growing from such a small base that you really hardly noticed. And then all of a sudden you hit the upward part of that curve. Once you get to one or two percent, suddenly you get into, if you're doubling now every two years, then suddenly, you know, two percent, four percent, eight percent, sixteen percent, and suddenly you're on your way. And when we look back at technologies that we have adopted in the past, like automobiles and televisions and washing machines and telephones and, and, and color TV, you name it, 
they all tend to follow something that looks very much like this curve. And so we are at sort of this uh, exponential point in this curve with the whole range of these technologies, these clean energy technologies that we're talking about. We're just, it's, uh, it's just absolutely blasting off and the current situation with the war in Ukraine has only lit a fire under that. So, so what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> Industrial scale storage. Oh, okay, so is that good? Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah. The whole benefits from what's happening up in Lovey's that who gets the reward? Well, it's it's owned uh, jointly by uh, uh, Consumers Energy and TTE. So I think I think Consumers owns fifty one percent. So technically, they're in charge. So what do they do, like in the state of Michigan, for example? What do they do? I mean, what do they? How do we benefit? Like, well, we benefit because uh, this is the interesting thing, the ironic thing, is that this was built uh, about 40 years ago. And it was built because at the time we had this big generation of, of new nuclear plants as well as big uh, coal plants that were coming online. And the thing about these giant power plants is uh, they don't do very well if you try to ramp them up and down according to demand. Right, uh, you you run them flat out, and that's how they're most efficient. And you just keep them on uh, as best you can. So you end up with a whole lot of power sometimes at three o'clock in the morning that nobody needs. So the solution to this was we'll build this pump storage power plant to, in a sense, back up the nuclear plants because we, you know it's not economical and maybe not even safe to try to run those and balance them against. Uh, demand that is fickle and all over the place. So we ended up with uh, uh, this great pump storage plant uh, that is finding a whole new uh, uh, purpose in an era when now that we're thinking about uh, uh, solar and wind, which are variable, you know. But when you when you have a plant of that size and it's just to give you an idea, it's above the same scale as the Hoover Dam. So this is this is not a, a science project. This is like a real deal. And uh, so um, so we are able to you know not just store energy and release it when we need it, but also perform a number of like delicate engineering. Uh, sort of balancing <coughs> operations on the grid to just sort of keep everything nice and even and make our grid hopefully more reliable and uh, uh, less apt to failure than it would otherwise be. So it's a huge benefit if you have something like this on your grid. And, and as we get even more storage and we get even more diverse types of storage, then those options become even more interesting. You know, for instance, five or ten years from now, many of us, if not most of us, are going to have electric cars in our garage. And more and more of these cars are being built with so-called bi-directional charging capability. So in other words, you can plug it in and you can charge it. The charge goes into the car. But you can also cut a deal with your local utility, and if you got the right software, and Ford and General Motors are talking about putting the software uh, into the, to their vehicles, then you cut a deal with the utility, and your software is constantly talking to the utility. And your car is sitting in your garage at night, and it's saying, I'm charged, I'm charged. And the utility, if, if something comes along, like the Donald C. Cook power plant cuts out or something. And, okay, so uh, so you need a little extra power. And uh, so some of the, the, the utility will draw a little bit off of that, uh, a, a whole bunch of, of different units, a little bit, and keep the grid stable. And then the owner gets some either a credit on their bill or a check in the mail. We saw this in California, uh, not with cars, but with the uh, well, with the the, the uh, Tesla makes something called a Powerwall, which is a, a gizmo that you 
you put in your basement and it, it stores about 13 kilowatt hours of energy. And you cut a deal with the utility, the software talks to the utility, and so they had this terrible uh, heat wave in September, and this was the first trial they had. This is what they call a virtual power plant. And there was enough people signed up that it was equivalent to 50 megawatts of energy that was available onto the grid, grid right when they needed it. And that 50 megawatts, that's a respectable power plant. And they're signing up enough people that they're adding, last time I read about this, they're adding about four megawatts a week, just with the hundreds of people that are signing up for this program. Uh, just during that one week where they had a real tense situation in California, people came away with, nobody, it's not like winning the lottery, but they came away with 30 or 60 bucks, and their life didn't go up. So, uh, you know, that's how we done it. Yes? Oftentimes they have solar panels, but it's not mandatory. I mean, some people will just have that storage just like I might have a generator, you know, and I'll just charge it, and keep it charged, and if there's a blackout, then I get off. You know. So uh, I, I have a whole, I live mostly in Hawaii, and I'm in the process of going solar. Sure. And I've converted my appliances, I've cut all the gas off. So I have an induction stove now. Oh, okay. The the hybrid water. Sure, sure. Um, and I will have the Tesla power wall oh, okay. in the garage um, with the customer car eventually. Sure. But my question is, in Hawaii, it's very easy to be self-sufficient like that. How would that work for a homeowner in Michigan? Is it even possible? It's harder uh, because. Uh, my, my life has been a really interesting spiral because uh, uh, for the first, well, for 40 years or so there, I was mostly kind of on the other side of the table from uh, the utilities. But now they've moved around a lot so that they kind of really like me and they talk to me all the time. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, so I, I know a lot of really nice people at the utility, and, and they're in a difficult position because they've got, uh, they have concerns about uh, their need to maintain the grid and what their costs are on the grid. And so they're concerned about giving up control of the generation and allowing people like you to have solar panels and then, you know, put as much extra energy as you may generate out onto the grid and because their point is like your costs are minimal but like we're on the hook for like billions and billions and billions of dollars and we're really worried about having a bunch of you know uh, uh, crazy people out there doing whatever they want to do you know and and so so they're not quite there yet. There are other states like Hawaii where they, you know, for very compelling economic reasons, they're trying to make it as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. I think those compelling, uh, those reasons will become compelling here too as the price of batteries and solar and things like that get lower and lower and lower and lower. I think the, the utilities are going to come around and see that it is in their best interest to make it as easy to do in Michigan as it is in California and Hawaii. Well, they, like in Hawaii, it is so successful that they don't even talk that net, net metering, metering anymore yeah. because I think the companies were losing they're not getting as much money. Uh -huh. um, so they tried to offer it out like that. But I'm just wondering, even if, would there be enough solar, say, for a homeowner here, even with a battery? No, oh. It, well, it, 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 it depends. It, it, it depends. You know, uh, like my house is. Uh, I don't have a south-facing roof, and I'm uh, surrounded by trees. So my house is not all that great for solar. But if you do have a south-facing roof, then Michigan is a fine place to do solar. Uh, and how would that like if it snows? Uh, well, uh, you still you're still generating power even if it because it, it comes right through the snow, but then the, uh, uh, the, the snow tends to slide off those pallets uh, because, because they are uh, 
they're dark, they, they begin to warm up and, and then the snow tends to come off. And in fact, in one of my other presentations, I've got a slide of the University of Michigan has developed a coating that they tested in Alaska where you put it on the, the panel and then the snow just, it just slides right off. And so there's all kinds of things going on like that to make it more and more. But, but generally, through most of the months of the year in Michigan, it's, it's uh, definitely viable. And in fact, uh, on, a, on a cold, sunny day, uh, they're actually more efficient. So uh, they, they work best in the wintertime in that sense. Uh, yes. Okay, I'm getting a little <laughs> So, uh, uh, any, any last questions? One last question. Okay, yes. Um, bringing it closer to home, looking at Dow Chemical Company here and throughout the United States and internationally, how would you rank um, their efforts compared mm -hmm. to other corporations, you know, fact, yeah, companies, industries, I should say, of this of a similar size as far as commitment to renewables? Well, I don't, I'm not, I'm not as knowledgeable about Dow as I should be to, to make, you know, some kind of a judgment on that. My understanding is that the top management gets it, you know, that it's important and we have to move in these directions. And they also see the opportunity uh, of, of the products and services that they can provide in this new environment and they're moving aggressively in those areas and I you know I have applauded them for that you know many times uh, I think Dow does a lot of really good things that I completely support they do a few things that I disagree with but uh, overall I think uh, Dow like I think the overwhelming majority of, of, of top-level professional management teams, of, of corporate management teams around the country, they get climate change. They just do. You won't find climate denial people in management suites anymore, for the most part. Even in oil companies, you know, uh, they uh, the oil companies are of course trying to. Uh, draw the transition out as long as they can, you know. But they understand what what is what is going on. So uh, I, you know, I hope that uh, that Dow uh, continues to to build on what they they've already started. I mean, Hemlock Semiconductor is a Dow Corning kind of spinoff, and it's the most important uh, manufacturer of the polycrystal and silicon uh, in the country by far. And uh, in fact, one of my best buddies from high school and college uh, works there. So uh, I'm like a huge proponent of Hemlock uh, Semiconductor and, and uh, try to let people know about it every time I get the chance. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.